Hey everybody, this is Jonathan Schrantz, and today I do want to share with you guys something a little bit extra special. I've been doing a little bit of research, and I want to share with you guys the top 20 most popular Sicilian variations. So I've been doing a little bit of research. I've been hanging out on the Leeches database. So I've created a study that I'll put in the links in the description below, as well as some of the timestamps of some of the variations that you're going to see today. So if there's anything that particularly interests you, you can jump around. This video will be parts, uh, the openings from least popular to most popular. So we're going from number 20 to 11 in this, ver in this video. And then in the next video, we'll do the top 10 most popular Sicilian variations. And this is just kind of to give you guys a little overview of the different types of Sicilians. So maybe if you're just not familiar with a lot of the different variations, or maybe you're trying to figure out which variation should I play with black, or I play white and my opponents do a lot of stuff. Just giving you guys just a, a big overview of all the variations. Obviously, we're not diving super deep into the theory here, but we're just listing them out so you guys can kind of get a good idea of what's out there and you can decide how that affects your repertoire and what you need to prepare. So the data that I've used for this is coming from the Leeches database. Um, if you guys haven't explored this very much on Leeches, you can set it up. So I'm on the master database. Presumably if I did just the Leeches database, um, I could be looking at some totally different games. Maybe amateur games are a little bit different. There's different ways that we could do this. Um, let me know what you guys think. But we're looking at top level games. So um, it even says 2200 plus FIDE rated players starting from 1952 all the way up until 2019. So with that in mind, let's get started with this list. Number 20, the least popular opening that we're going to be looking at is the pin variation. Although right off the bat, it should be noted, um, just to put it on the radar, look how many games um, are actually with Knight F3 here. We're talking about almost 400,000 games. And the next most popular move, Knight to C3, is 35,000. So just keep that in mind. So even the 20, uh, 20th most popular is still an open Sicilian. And not D6, not Knight C6. We're talking about one of the E6 variations. And the reason this the pin variation is because after it's an open Sicilian, White can toss in Knight to F6, which is a pretty rare move. And this could be an indication that they're playing a Scheveningen. We'll look at it. Maybe it's a four knights. We'll have a look at it. Now, we're starting with the pin variation, which has a very bad reputation. It's not supposed to be any good. White plays the simple move, e5, attacking the knight. And this is black's point, putting a lot of pressure on the knight. And white has two common ways of dealing with this. Bishop to d2, and the very interesting queen to g4. It is worth noting that even though this is a rare opening, if you do take a look here in the database, Aronian has played it, Jobava has played it, and they've won with it. Okay, this was a blitz game, this was a rapid game. But hey, if these guys can play it in blitz and rapid, it probably means the rest of us can try to make it work in our, our longer games as well. It is also worth noting that the two highest rated players did prefer bishop to d2, um, which is the most popular move. Queen to g4 is interesting. Um, I've already drawn a little bit of arrows here. When black castles, we're going to play bishop to h6 and win in exchange. So in a lot of these variations, the reason it's dubious is because black is giving up material. But he's just arguing, I have a lot of pressure, I have a lot of activity. And watch how interesting it can get. Queen to g3, which is a move that maybe your opponents wouldn't be able to find. They are under a lot of pressure already. Black can ramp it up with queen to c5. I love this move. Just adding another attacker. It's a very weird maneuver um, that the queen does this strange dance all the way over to f5, putting pressure on the knight on c3. And now after knight e2, how else are you going to deal with this? You're also blocking in your bishop, so you're making it as uncomfortable for white as you possibly can. Black will simply develop white can castle. And after some trades here, we can win another pawn and enter this fascinating end game where it's white is up in exchange black has a pawn for the exchange and yeah not easy to say what's going on here objectively white is up material and should be doing very well but yeah i think in practical terms it's not that easy and that's why you play the sicilian is to get some crazy stuff like this so if you're interested in doing this as black feel free to knock yourself out i do want to rewind um, if not queen g4, if white does decide to play like all the super GMs we've seen, it's going to be a very similar story. 
after the captures they usually take with their pawn and after the bishop goes back again queen to g4 and perhaps you could try to play g6 even though that'll allow something like maybe bishop h6 preventing castling maybe h4 h5 coming soon so black just castles and after bishop h6 again gives up an exchange and yeah argues we got the exchange but i have the dark squared bishop he's going to be very powerful this pawn is very weak over here um and yeah you're going to get a very interesting game black's going to try to get his pieces out quickly start to get an initiative and again objectively it shouldn't work white is up material so with best play white is doing very well um but yeah if you want to gamble a little bit the pin variation is an interesting way to go also another gamble is the wing variation you won't see this very often only in 0.11 percent of all sicilian games are you going to see this wacky move before gambiting upon um but it is worth noting this was played in a u.s championship timor gureyev of course timor played it against Gadakomsky and got a draw so yeah you can play b4 in the u.s champs you can make a draw um you can play it almost anywhere and the point is, after the sacrifice, you're going to play moves like a3, you're going to play moves like d4. In the U.S. Championship game, we saw knight f3 first, which is very rare. Um, d6, also very rare. But eventually, we get sort of a, a similar position where the point of the gambit is, white is taking the center, and white's hopefully going to get an initiative. Black's still one turn away from castling. Um, you know, we are castled. We have three pieces out. Black has two out. We're going to get this pawn back, and we're going to start playing in the middle and get some stuff going. So if you're interested in this, it is a very interesting gambit. Again, probably not sound, but at the non-professional level, it should be just fine and a very interesting and dangerous weapon. Another interesting, dangerous weapon that, again, might be slightly dubious is the Smith-Mora Gambit. However, this one does have a lot of potential to get an absolutely amazing attacking position for white. The idea, again, is we're playing d4. This is 0.55% of all Sicilian games. And if they capture, obviously there's many ways for white to decline. But the whole point is we're developing as fast as we can. We're going to bring the knight to f3. Let me make it white's turn so I can drag my pieces. Knight to f3 bishop to c4 this bishop is coming out somewhere maybe one of these squares depending on what black does queen's going to go to e2 white's going to castle put the rooks in the middle and play as quickly as possible after knight f3 the most common reply is e6 there's obviously quite a few variations in this but again we just see bishop c4 and after a6 castles white already has three pieces out black only has one piece out white is castled black is not this can get very very dangerous and just to follow the line a little bit longer, I think it would be only fair that we show a game from Mark Esserman, who wrote a whole book on the Smith Mora, the most famous Mora player out there, who actually won a game against Luke Von Whaley, which is a major accomplishment and kind of a testament that this is a very, very dangerous opening. Just look at how Black has played. This probably is fine for Black, but you do have to be very careful, often finding only moves in order to survive. And one of the most typical sacrifices, obviously we're not going to go super deep into this, is knight to d5, which cuts the board in half. And yeah, after asking this knight a question, you can play the move d6, unleashing the bishop on b3, locking in the bishop on f8. And yeah, you can tell the sack the piece, get the pressure, and go right after that king. f4, trying to open up the game. And after queen f6, which is actually... A big fatal error. I think you had to take on f4, but that looks super dangerous. Queen f6 makes sense. Maybe black's going to get to castle, but nope. Um, don't want to go too deep into this game, but just kind of watch how it happens. Black king gets stranded. Has to give up a piece. And yeah, tons and tons and tons of pressure. Going to win some material here. Um, the game ended here. If rook to c8, there's bishop to g5. So yeah, the game actually ended in this position. And yeah, it's just a testament, a nice model game there for how to absolutely crush somebody with the Mora. So if you're interested in that and you like sacking a pawn and you like getting all your pieces out really quick and trying to get the initiative, the Mora might be one for you to take a look at. So now, toning it down a notch, at least on the surface, our next opening here is the Shaveningen. So this is an open Sicilian, and this position is actually the starting 
point for a whole lot of variations. You can see over here, it does give you an idea of where it stands. We are currently going to look at E6, but yeah, here a lot of the most popular open Sicilians do occur from this variation with D6. So after E6, we get the Shave and Ingen, and most people that play it don't actually play it in this move order. A lot of people that are trying to achieve this structure as black, what they're actually going to do is they're gonna start with a move like A6, or some other developing move, knight to c6, and then later achieve this structure. But it's one of the most important structures to understand if you do play the Sicilian. This is the Shaveningen and structure. And all these lines are pretty much fine for black. The one dangerous line that you want to know about is g4, the carry's attack. And yeah, it can get dangerous. White is going all out. And black really ought to stop this with a move like h6. And white's going to go for it playing h4. After knight to c6, white is going to insist. Um, he's going to play rook to g1. Here black can play the move d5, a non-displayed d5. It does lead to an end game where black is probably suffering a little bit. I don't know why you'd want to play it as black. It's not the most fun you can have. But d5 here is a playable option. Um, and it's been tested out a lot at the highest level. But interestingly enough, h5 is the way to go. Black is actually hoping that white will close it up but interestingly enough, white takes on h5, and the idea is, after some, some moves, we're going to have pressure always on the queen side. Eventually, this pawn may become dangerous if it starts moving up the board, and there's always this annoying pressure on the g7 pawn. That all being said, black usually plays queen to b6 here, kicking that knight back. Eventually, this queen will actually probably drop back maybe to c7, but yeah, the idea is black's going to castle that way. White's going to get this annoying pressure. Should be good for white. A lot of engines, they often say things like plus one, maybe more than that. But if you look at correspondence games, maybe it's not that simple. And there are some tricks here for black. So if you are interested and you you like this, you can try to make it work. Uh, I was playing it a lot as black, and it's it seems fine, at least in practice. But yeah, it can be dangerous, and you can just get squashed by white. So do be wary if you have this in your repertoire. If you play the Shaven Ingen, you got to book up on the carry's attack. Moving on, the O'Kelly variation. This is a real oddball. I love this one, at least at first sight. If you've never seen it, this one's going to strike you as really, really odd. A6 on move two, A6. It looks kind of like the Nidorf, but really, A6? Black's gone mad, hasn't developed the pieces, and it does have one clever idea, though, um, often known as a one-trick pony. White can decide to set up a Roxy bind. White can play knight to c3. I believe objectively the best move is actually c3, but it does set a clever trap. If you have an opponent that always plays the open Sicilian, and you know they're going to play d4, a6 is a good way to take them right out of their comfort zone. And the clever point is you've stopped knight to b5, and you're ready to hit white with e5. So if they capture and they take back, you can toss in the move, knight to f6 and i do just want to take this moment to point out that here and in a lot of variations in the sicilian e5 is not going to work if you're a beginner this is going to happen all the time um so something like this actually loses a pawn to queen a5 and you can just munch 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 so it's usually worth it for black to play knight f6 to force white to put a pawn in front of the c pawn not letting him achieve the Maroxy structure and with that in mind here is the clever point behind a6 Black can now play the move e5. So kicking that knight away, and notice how we can no longer go to the b5 square. Uh, possible is going to knight b3, is playing knight to b3. Yeah, you're not really doing that much over there. Maybe you'd rather be on the king side. If you do play knight to f5, um, you're going to be hit with this common tactic, d5, and that's going to be really good for black. And that pretty much leaves, eh, you can go to e2, blocking your bishop. But, okay, knight to f3 is what most people are playing. And now you can get kind of an improved pin variation. Black pins the knight, and he has the idea of playing d5 in the, the near future here. So, black gearing up for d5. And so white here really has to be careful. I do want to point out, white should play a move like bishop to c4, trying to be active. He could play a move like Bishop to d2, breaking the pin. Um, but I've seen this before in practice in some beginner games. And you see this move all the time, Bishop to d3. And I've even seen a game at the beginner level 
that now went d5, amazing move, and you hate to see it, but every now and then, white blunders, they take, not realizing that e4 is a super fork. Looks like maybe there's two people attacking the e-pawn, but no, the, this knight is pinned, so black will win material here with the move e4. If queen e2, you can of course play queen to e7. So, yeah, the O'Kelly is an interesting variation. If somebody only plays the open Sicilian, you want to trick them, that might be the way to go. Now to some sharp openings here, the Grand Prix attack, and I do just want to state for fans of the closed Sicilian that I haven't really been fair in categorizing these. I've kind of separated the Grand Prix attack from the closed Sicilian. But take a look, Knight to C3 here um, is actually 35,000 games. It's about 7% of all of the games in the database. And I didn't 100% know how to categorize things like the Grand Prix because it could be F4 on move one, which is sometimes met with D5, but sometimes it's just a, a normal knight to C6 or something else. And after knight to C3, again, there's a whole bunch of variations like black would play knight to C6 or D6, but for this, I've only counted knight to C6 and then F4. My apologies to Grand Prix slash Close Sicilian defenders out there. Your opening probably ranks a little bit higher if you count all the transpositions, but this is just the simplest way for me to categorize it here. Apologies. Leave me angry comments below. That'll be fine. I can live with it. But the idea behind the Grand Prix attack is white's going to develop all the pieces very, very quickly, and these pawns are going to be used as kind of a battering ram, usually F5, but potentially E5 also could be a push in the early middle game, but knight's coming out, bishop's coming out, either to c4 or even to b5, white's going to castle and go all out for an attack. Now I just want to show um, some of these moves are not the greatest, but let's just put that bishop on c5, on c4, because that's where I see a lot of, uh, a lot of beginner games, this is how it goes, something like this, and we get to this starting point, here's how white basically sets up the pieces, and he goes in with queen e1. Now, white's main plan is he's going to play f5, usually sacking this pawn, either way white takes, you're going to ignore it, you're going to bring that queen over to h4, you're going to rush this bishop into h6, you're going to trade this bishop, knight's going to jump in, queen's going to checkmate, and you do all these moves, and then all the time you see white get this amazing checkmating attack that you can kind of follow a blueprint, checkmate him, no big deal, it happens all the time. So, if you like these aggressive openings, check out the Grand Prix attack. It is very fascinating. Objectively, there's probably a reason top people don't move this F-pawn. It does weaken the king, and black is probably in time with some uh, something in the center to get enough counterplay. But a lot of beginners, they won't be good at getting counterplay, and whoever has the initiative is probably who's going to win. So if you're into it, play the Grand Prix attack. It can get very dangerous, and you can study the, the checkmating patterns and get the same patterns over and over. The Four Knights variation. This is an interesting one that I've dabbled with before. And in this position, this is an E6 open Sicilian. We bring out all of our knights. And <laughs> yeah, this has happened. 0.95% of all Sicilian games. We're approaching 1% territory here. And there's two critical moves. A lot of these moves down here are not that critical. Um, taking on C6 is a very interesting line that can be could be good for white. Um, knight D to B5 is actually the most common move. And one reason people do prefer this move order as black is because now if you can play the main move D6, you actually can lead to the main line of the Sveshnikov, which we're going to cover later. But after bishop to F4 provoking E5, the bishop can go to G5. And this is the main line of Sveshnikov, which we will talk about later. Um... If you want to keep it in independent territory here, just keep it in four knights territory, this bishop can come out either to c5, which is interesting, or bishop to b4, and I just will show one main move. A lot of good people have done this. Ivanchuk, Yu Yang Yi, uh, MVL's done this two times. Kramnik's done it. So it is very interesting. White will normally play a3 and earn that bishop pair. And black plays this move, d5. And you get an isolated pawn. White has the two bishops. So probably this is good for white, but here you get an interesting position. Here's kind of the starting point for this middle game where white decides between f3 and bishop to g5. It's an interesting move. It actually does kind of cramp white quite a bit, this d pawn, but of course white has the two bishops in the better pawn structure. So 
yeah, you can risk it. It is playable. A lot of good fellas have gone for it. Grishuk's on the list. Lenderman's on the list. It's very interesting, and obviously there's a lot of lines that could have been more favorable for black along the way. So if you want something that's kind of unusual, that it's going to be offbeat, people aren't going to be looking forward to, try the Fortnite's variation. A lot of people don't know anything about it, so you could get some good positions right away. Moving on, let's talk now about the closed Sicilian. This is uh, the way I've categorized it for this one. Again, true apologies to closed Sicilian players. I'm only counting in this position the move G3. There are some other move orders. But the basic position of this is white kind of slow plays it and doesn't really reveal his true cards until black determines how he wants to set up. And the most common way of playing here is actually bishop to e3. We're not telling you where this pawn's going. Maybe the pawn is going to stay here. Maybe it's going to go here. Maybe the knight's going to follow behind to f3. Or maybe the knight's just going to go to e2 and the pawn's going to stay on f2 for a little bit. White is not revealing his cards, just simply developing. And many things that black could do, he could play e6, 97, try to play in the middle right away. He could play a6, b5, or he can even play rook to b8. Let's just look at one line here. Um, this is some, some pretty interesting stuff. White, again, staying as flexible as possible on the king side, not revealing his cards. Black will get some action on the queen side, um, and eventually white will have to decide. F4 was another common move here, but one line goes B4, knight to D1. Pay attention to these white knights. It's kind of funny what can happen here. And after black plays knight to D4, playing in the middle, we castle E6, knight to C1, which is a very clever move. White is going to be playing for an attack after the move f4, f5, and he's going to play c3, but he doesn't want to trade the knights. So a very interesting idea. Knight e7, c3, kicking that knight away, and then just following up with some sort of attack over here. Um, if you like this and you like to slow down the game and then maneuver and go for a checkmate, this is a very interesting line. So I think this one is actually underrated, and unlike a lot of the other variations that we looked at, this is actually the first one where if I plop this engine on, it's going to be like white is better. A lot of these, um, a lot of these have been like dubious, and whichever side is playing the dubious line has been worse. But this is actually a pretty good line for white. So if you're interested, the close Sicilian might be an interesting one, and not a lot of people play it. So it's only uh, only 1.49 percent of all Sicilian games. Moving on, this is our second to last one that we're going to be looking at in this video. We're going to be looking at a very interesting opening, the Kalashnikov. Uh, a lot of people don't know a thing about it, but after knight to c6, so this is the first time we've seen knight to c6, we will get an open Sicilian, and now immediately black plays this move e5, which you can kind of look over here. It's not the most common. Knight f6 or g6 are more popular, but there it is, the move e5. And this is very similar to the Sveshnikov. Um, just to put it on your radar, the Sveshnikov would be knight f6, knight c3, and then e5. And we've moved into Sveshnikov territory. But here, you can also play it immediately, um, which has a little bit of differences. So because this knight has not committed to f6, one idea is to actually put the knight on e7. So after knight to b5, you can play d6. I do want to point out a very interesting line the Lowenthal variation, and not a lot of people have played this. It failed to make the top 20. I do want to point it out here because there is a candidate master in the St. Louis area, um, at least he used to live in the St. Louis area, that was playing this way with some success. I do think that based on the fact that it's only been played a thousand times, does lead to interesting positions, does mean you can play it, and I might take a look at it myself. It's a very interesting move after knight to d6 watch how crazy it can get so we lose the bishops it looks very nice looks like this queen has installed herself in there pretty good so most people are going to play queen to f6 you've got to somehow get that queen out of there so that you can castle white here does not want to trade just trading on f6 makes black's life easy black will take back with a knight it's no big deal so most people are going to retreat all the way to d1 now check this out queen g6 that's an annoying move eyeing this pawn putting pressure on g2, so knight to c3, and now d5, like out of nowhere. What's this all about? If white, white usually takes here, and then queen e4, what's going on? So that's kind of the point of this. 
I think it's not that bad. People should play this. Um, and it gets crazy, because now knight d4, what's going on? White is threatening a fork. Black is threatening a fork. Uh, white usually will start with this one. We go to e7, and then rook c1 defending the c pawn. Yeah, the line just goes further. It gets crazy. It gets complicated. Very messy, very murky. And if that's what you're into and that's what you want, and that's why you're playing the Sicilian, aren't you? This might be a very, very interesting Lowenthal variation. Check it out. But most people here, they're not going to play a6. Uh, they're going to play d6. And as mentioned in the intro to this one, the Kalashnikov, after knight to c3, a6, we're going to hop back. They play b5, threatening a fork on b4. And after you jump in, the idea is instead of playing knight to f6, we could play knight to f6 and get into, uh, try to get back to a Sveshnikov here. But after knight to e7, uh, what we'll have to think a little bit differently. Now, the most common move here is c4. Usually with the knight on f6, you can pin it right away if you want to and you can slow play it. You can pin and you can play like c3 bringing this knight around, keeping control over that d5 square. So this is a slightly interesting option for black. Now after c4, black plays this interesting move. Knight to d4. Now that you can't play c3, black can hop right on in. And after bishop to e3, an interesting idea here for black is to take and then just simply play bishop to e7, allowing the capture on d4. So if black does go for this pawn, which most people are not, you can see even looking at the database, look how black it is. That means black is going to win all of these games. Um, after the capture, a very strong move here is bishop to f, uh, sorry, pawn to f5, just breaking open the position and getting a huge initiative here. You can imagine moves like bishop to f6 coming, white's going to castle. There's going to be a lot of pressure. White still has a little bit of work to do to get his king safe. So this actually will lead to a strong initiative for black. So most people are going to leave that alone, and we're going to get castled and take it from here. So a very interesting one. If you kind of like the Sveshnikov, you can compare. Do you want to play the Sveshnikov? Do you want to play the Kalashnikov? Do you want to play the Lowenthal? Um, check them all out. If this is the kind of structure that you're into, check them all out, compare them, and, and try to figure out which one is right for you. Now our last one here for the day. This is the 11th most popular opening, aka the least popular opening, not in the top 10. And after e4, c5, knight f3, the first of our many dragons. Hopefully you can see that over here. Hyper accelerated dragon, accelerated dragon, and then the dragon. So we got a lot of dragons back to back to back. And the least popular of all is the hyper accelerated dragon. This one, has it gone too far? Well, first of all, it's got the coolest name in all of chess, so you may want to play it just for that reason. And one interesting line you can get in the Hyper Accelerated Dragon is d4. Where after takes, we might reach a normal dragon after some moves, maybe just take back with the knight. But the interesting option that we have is to take here with our queen. Now, this attacks the rook directly, so black will usually defend by moving the knight. And here, we can play e5, harassing the knight, Obviously, there's no check here. We can just defend, and the e-pawn is covered sufficiently. So after knight to c6, we'll have to move our queen. Um, usually, the queen goes over here, kind of defending against any checks. Now, after the knight moves, <laughs> the queen just moves back. Queen to e4. Um, and yeah, you can tell. There is lots of moves here for white. The main line goes knight to b4. And... Yeah, you can tell this is going to get complicated. This is going to get sharp. So pay attention and see if you got the guts to play like this. <laughs> Bishop to b5. And now queen a5. Threatening some discoveries. This knight is going to move with some discoveries. So knight to c3. Defending the bishop. Blocking against any discoveries. And now d5. What? You got to get this bishop out. Bishop's going to f5. After the capture. Bishop f5. Queen's got to move, and then this is a remarkable move. Like, the knight can't take. It's in a pin. We're poking the rook again. We're doing everything we can. In some lines, if this knight moved away, maybe there'd be a discovered check winning a queen. Lots of interesting tactics going on. We did, of course, allow knight to c2, king e2. Black's going to castle. It's a mess. Giving up a rook. Ah, it's a mess. So if you like this sloppy play, um, you go for it. The main, main line here is actually like, Pretty winning for white, 
But I think in practical terms, this is not going to be an easy one. And yeah, every line here, you can you can play around with this for a lot. If you, and if you do play this way and you want to play um, against the Hyper Accelerated Dragon, you may want to look at this Queen Takes line. It gets very sharp. It gets very crazy. And if that's for you and you want to live like this, you go for it. Uh, if you want to allow this as black, you can book up. You can find the line that works for you that you want to try and give it a go. So I do hope you guys enjoy that. Please subscribe so that you do know when the next part comes out and all my exciting content is out there. Um, if there's other openings too, I'm doing this for the Sicilian. I would love to do this for the Rui Lopez, maybe some other openings. And I'm always open to suggestions. So what kind of openings would you guys want to see a top 10 or top 20 most popular variations for? Um, as always, hit like too. Everybody should like this. And uh, I'll see you guys later.